tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. <laughs> Good evening. I'm storyteller Otis Gyre, and I ain't your grandfather. From where I'm from, we don't do bedtime stories. And if that's what you were expecting, you're in the wrong place. If it's terrifying tales you're after, well then. I've got just the thing. Get comfortable. Settle in. Turn off the lights, if you dare. Your night is about to get a whole lot darker. <laughs> Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs> <laughs> Good evening. You're listening to Scary Stories Told in the Dark. Welcome, dear listeners, to Season 10, Episode 11. I'm your host, Otis Jiry, and in this episode, I'll be performing four tales to terrify you, courtesy of author Jordan Group, about quizzical killers, baleful basements, extraterrestrial escapees, hellish hired guns. You're listening to the standard edition of tonight's program, which contains the first two spine-tingling stories. If you'd like to show your support and enjoy an extended version of this and other episodes with twice the terror, visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today. Thank you for your support. Now, it's time to take a walk together down the moonlit trail. So lock your doors, turn your lights down low, and settle in. The show is about to begin. <laughs> This episode of Scary Stories Told in the Dark is proudly brought to you by Surfshark. Let's talk about protection because, frankly, everyone could use some. And no, I don't mean that kind of protection. I'm talking about the kind that protects you online, one of the places we all spend a large portion of our time. It's no secret that websites, hackers, and various third parties track your online activity across the internet. Hell, even your internet provider can spy on your online activity and then sell that data to third parties. Those zicky third party services can then infiltrate your systems without requiring any permission on your end whatsoever. This blind spot in your website security infrastructure can end up compromising your software platforms and data, leading to severe consequences. I know, it's happened to me. One of many examples is the Ticketmaster incident of 2018. They became a victim of a mage cart type attack, creating a massive data breach. Confidential data of customers who've used Ticketmaster websites to book tickets during that period, including their name address, email address, telephone numbers, and credit card details. The malicious code was spotted a whole four months after it started. Needless to say, the damage was already done. Thankfully, you can avoid all that mess with something called a VPN. VPNs hide your location, making it more difficult to identify you from a crowd of users. Think of a VPN as a safety net from the bad guys trying to target you. So, what are you waiting for? Try Surfshark risk-free for 30 days. Money-back guarantee. Get Surfshark VPN at surfshark.deals slash scary stories. Enter promo code scary stories 
for 83% off and three extra months free. You heard me right. Three extra months for free. That's surfshark.deals slash scary story. No one feels safe when a serial killer strikes an area. Why, the murderer could be anyone, anywhere, blending in, and popping out when you least expect it. But in our first tale by Jordan Group, a police detective, hoping to finally catch a lead on the murders in his town, is about to get more than he bargained for when the killer he seeks may be more than meets the eye. Without further ado, I present to you, Octopus Man. Being a police detective means you see a lot of horrible things. Things you can't unsee. They haunt your dreams at night, and the images spill over into the daytime. Waking nightmares. Ever hear those? I get them all the time. Pretty soon, every time you close your eyes, you see a flashback of something awful. An ice pick through an eye socket. A hammer drill invading someone's skull through the ear canal. Bodies missing pieces. Cadavers of all shapes and sizes, colors and creeds. Some killers don't discriminate. Most do. Did you know that serial killers predominantly murder only those from their own race and social standing? There are numerous motives that drive them. Financial gain, thrill-seeking, revenge, love, hate, or even the simple desire for attention. I don't think the octopus man ever wanted the attention, though. I don't think he killed for any reason other than because he could because he was good at it. Ever hear of outliers? He was an outlier, in many more ways than one. It was late spring, and Hollow's End was blooming. The smell of wet dirt and growing grass and flowers hung sweetly in the air as I got into my car, the sun still asleep behind the horizon. It was nearly 4 a.m., and I'd been awake all night. There was something about the most recent case that was bothering me. The murders that had occurred the night before still didn't make any sense. I don't know if I intended to drive over to the house on Calvin Crescent. Part of me thinks I just left to go for a drive to clear my head and try to think it over. My best ideas often come to me while driving. Despite my exhaustion after... Having denied myself sleep in favor of crime scene photos and witness statements, my eyes stayed open without effort. The rain slicked street unfurled itself from the darkness in front of me, the old Mercury's headlights illuminating crumbling laneways that crisscrossed the town. Calvin Crescent seemed to beckon me, and I found myself turning the steering wheel in ever tightening concentric circles bringing me spiraling closer and closer to the blood-stained home as I thought things over. No forced entry or exit, no murder weapons found, no witnesses or suspects, no fingerprints or video footage despite a myriad assortment of security cameras functioning at full capacity. What was I missing? The Thompsons were your everyday run-of-the-mill family of four, I went to church on Sunday. The boy played Little League on a team called the Wildcats, and the father was the coach. The mother was a member of the church's women's league, and the daughter was involved in gymnastics and ballet. Why the hell would anybody want to kill them? The coroner was doing his autopsy, and the report would be available that morning, sometime. I'd go there and see the man himself as well. Dr. Strange, as the other cops liked to call him. No wonder I couldn't sleep. The day was going to be jam-packed full of mental torture and gore. 
The doctor liked to torment me with his Socratic method of explanation through question and answer, as if it was my job to work for every single bit of information he had to give me. The man was a sadist, but at least he'd give me clues, things that I could work with. The 48-hour window was closing. After that, the chances of solving the case became more and more minuscule by the minute. Nothing bothered me like having no leads in a fresh murder. It made me feel inadequate, stupid, like I'd missed something. The worst part was this wasn't the first case like this. In the past several years, there had been more homes with dead families inside. No suspects or murder weapons found. The same situation was repeating itself over and over. The events coming closer and closer together. They had to be the same guy. But I was the only one who would admit that. I wasn't supposed to talk about it publicly. Serial killers aren't great for tourism, after all. The car came to a stop in front of a wide bungalow with red siding and a big maple tree out front. Hedges concealed the windows from the eyes of nosy neighbors, but also made it easier for things to happen inside unwitnessed. I got out of the car and closed the door quietly and carefully behind me. Making my footsteps soft and soundless had once been a challenge, uh, with my wide frame and tall stature, but I'd learned to do it effortlessly over the years. Still, despite my stealth, I felt a tingling on my neck like eyes watching as I approached the sentry. Knocking on his car window, I saw him jerk awake with a start, and he rolled down the glass to look at me. Jeez, man, you scared me. Where the hell did you come from, anyways? Frickin' ninja. Don't you sleep? I couldn't turn my mind off. Thought I'd get an early start. He looked guilty for a second, knowing what my next question would be. Knowing that I'd just caught him unawares. Anybody coming or going? Killers often return to the scene of the crime, but in such a small town, they'd stick out like a sore thumb, especially this time of night with no one on the streets, assuming the night watch was actually watching. We did have access to the cameras, both inside and out, the ones installed by the late owner of the house. Nobody. I decided not to scold him. For all I knew, he'd actually been doing his job, and I really was just that good. But it didn't sit right. Leaving him in his car, I approached the front door of the house, taking careful, quiet steps. Why did I feel so nervous suddenly? Opening the front door with the key, I went inside. It was dark, and I turned on the light in the entryway and looked around. Nothing had been moved as far as I could tell. The blood pulling on the floor of the kitchen could be seen from the doorway, and I walked further in to take another look around the murder scene. Three of the family members had been murdered in the kitchen. Judging by their positions and how they fell, it appeared that they were engaged in normal everyday life. The mother and two kids had sharp objects inserted through their ears, which caused the fatal damage. I assumed without a look at the autopsy report. Judging by the blood which had pooled around their heads like halos on the floorboards, dripping out of their ears. The bodies themselves were gone now, and all I had was the blood-soaked silhouettes that outlined them, and the memories that would stick with me. The images of them I could still see clearly, perfectly. None of the neighbors had heard a scream. No one saw anybody coming or going from the house. It was like a riddle. The father was found, separately, down in the basement in his office. Normally, he would be a prime suspect, but he had no defense wounds and no suspicious blood spatter. Furthermore, video footage from a security camera showed him in his office the whole time when the murder occurred. In the video footage, he steps out of the image for a second, as if he heard a noise. Then, his body collapses to the ground from out of frame a moment later. Blood spills out of his ear and pools on the floor all around him. 
same as the others. I looked at the steps leading down to the darkness in the basement. My whole body said not to go down there. The lights were broken like someone had thrown a rock at them, so I had to pull out my flashlight. Taking a few hesitant steps down into the moist air at the lower level, I reminded myself to breathe. Keeping to the outside of each step, I managed to avoid making any noise until I got near the bottom, and one of them creaked loudly. Why was I trying to be so quiet? The house was empty, right? The question squirmed in my mind, but I couldn't answer it properly, and I had to continue to ignore it. Just respect for the dead, that's all. But the bodies were gone, so who was I trying to be quiet for? My flashlight beam was insufficient in the darkness, and I moved slowly through the stacks of old crap that crowded the floor everywhere in the space at the bottom of the stairs. Ahead through the narrow path between the junk was the laundry room. I walked towards it and felt my hard jack hammering in my chest. The laundry room was empty, of course. The furnace room to the right was empty as well. I went through the door that led into the den, and past that was the office, where the husband had been murdered. Part of me really didn't want to go through that door. Shining my flashlight beam inside, I saw dingy, mildewed floorboards, an old TV, and stacks of magazines, old computer parts, stuffed animals, and board games. It was a junk room by the looks of it. The perfect place for someone to hide but we had cleared the house. There was no one there. So why did I feel like there were eyes on the back of my head, watching me at all times? The back of my neck tingled like there was someone staring at me so intently. I could feel it in my flesh. And just then, I heard a voice from behind me that nearly caused me to jump out of my skin. What's up, boss? I turned around and saw the officer from outside was standing in the doorway to the den. Jeez, kid, you scared the hell out of me. What are you doing down here? You're supposed to be outside watching the house. He looked at me funny. What do you mean? You just waved me in from the front door. I saw you. Figured you'd need a hand moving something. I didn't wave at you from the front door. What the hell are you talking about? That was when I saw the shape behind him. It was camouflaged and blended almost seamlessly with the darkness. The air rippled and shimmered like the air above asphalt on a hot day. Tentacles wrapped around the young officer. Gary was his name. The colors of the strange alien-looking appendages changed to match his uniform almost instantly. One of the tentacles probed up and into his ear like a kid giving a wet willy to an unfortunate classmate in school. What the fuck? He managed to get out. Only those two and a half words. And then I saw blood begin to jet like a fountain out of his ear. He collapsed to the floor loudly with a dull thud that rattled the floor. Blood began to pool around his head and he was completely still, not breathing. In the doorway to the den, I could see the shimmering outline still. The form of a man, almost, but not quite. His movements were quick and deliberate. As he ducked into the laundry room, I could see the colors of him blending and changing quickly, almost, but not quite catching up with the background as he moved. The man, or whatever he was, appeared to be wearing some sort of ultra-high-tech military equipment. At least, that's what I thought at first. Later on, I did research and found that no technology existed that even came close, unless it was highly classified and far beyond the current prototypes. The only thing that looked remotely close to what I'd seen that night in that basement on Calvin Crescent was something I discovered eventually on a nature program on television. It showed footage of an octopus blending seamlessly with its environment and moving through the water effortlessly with hypnotic movements as the colors shifted and matched the background exactly, but with a moment's delay. 
The memory came flooding back to me instantly. The image was the same. The shimmering, shifting colors that blended perfectly after a moment to adjust. That was when I started to call him the Octopus Man. Years later. But in that moment he was a phantom. A ghost who had just murdered a cop in front of me and then disappeared into the shadows of the basement like a specter. I was terrified. And that's not something that I experience often. It had been trained out of me with years of experience living in deadly situations. Basking in them like a hot bath and soaking in them. Danger is part of the job description when you're a homicide detective. But how the hell do you fight something you can't see? Part of me knew somehow that he was human, that he was killable, and that he needed to be killed, or he'd kill again and again. <laughs> I heard a raspy chuckle from the laundry room. I drew my gun and tucked the flashlight under my chin, desperate to maintain my light source, while calling for help on the radio. The radio, which should have been on my belt, was not there. It had been with me when I entered the house, but it was suddenly gone. Vanished like the phantom who was still laughing at me from the shadows. Moving slowly with tentative and curious steps, I walked through the doorway leading back to the stairs. My first goal was to stay alive and call for backup. Even when I was younger, I never tried to be a hero. That's a good way to get yourself killed in this business. The laundry room was immediately to my right, and I shone the flashlight and pointed my gun along with it, hoping he wouldn't be foolish enough to attack a man with a gun pointed straight at him. But then I heard a noise above me, like suction cups quickly sticking and unsticking. Then a thump behind me like a person had been hanging from the ceiling and dropped down in the darkness to land on the floor. I spun around and the gun and flashlight were knocked out of my hand by a heavy appendage, rough and somehow slippery at the same time. Falling to the ground, I rolled quickly, knowing somehow that to stay still would be my death. My instinct proved correct as I heard a slamming sound where my face had been a split second earlier, and looked over to see the floorboards cracked in a spiderweb pattern where something heavy had just been brought to the ground. The bastard was trying to kill me. There was no doubt about that. His form color shifted as it seemed to float over towards me, not walking like a person but gliding across the floor as he approached. He picked me up and threw me across the room like a rag doll. I landed hard on a wooden chair which broke into pieces on impact. Landing hard on the floor, I opened my eyes to see him slithering toward me again. My hand felt a sharp piece of the broken chair, and I seized upon it, desperate. Without being sure of where or what I was striking out for, I thrust the sharp piece of broken chair leg into the air, hoping not to miss, knowing that to miss would mean my death. But I didn't miss. The chair leg disappeared into him, and a spray of black, tarry blood, like ink, poured from the wound. The black arterial spray covered him and made him visible to me for a moment before he escaped. He expanded and seemed to grow in size, puffing outward like a black parachute in the night. Tentacles whipped around the edges of him, flailing and whipping in the air around his form. He wailed and shrieked a blood-curdling scream. I was terrified and unsure what the hell this thing was that I had just stabbed in self-defense. Would it kill me now as it killed the others? With its true form finally revealed, I was no closer to knowing what it was than when it had been invisible. It truly looked like a demon sent from hell. I thought it would come for me and take my life, but the thing seemed to only want to get away in that moment. Hurt, perhaps, for the first time in its existence. It jumped up into the air and clung to the ceiling like a bat, then scuttled away and disappeared up the stairs. I heard the front door open and close a moment later, and it was gone. The images are still burnt into my memory to this day. I'm retired now, but I still have nightmares about them. 
about it. There are a few perks to being a retired detective. One of them is that you get a heads up sometimes when things are happening out there in the underworld of our city, especially since my old partner is the lead detective on the case in question. I hear a lot that the public isn't privy to, like how there's been a new string of murders. They fit an old pattern of a killer who was dormant for years, one who was never captured. No forced entry or exit, no murder weapons found, no witnesses or suspects, no fingerprints or video footage despite a myriad assortment of security cameras functioning at full capacity. I know who the killer is, though. The Octopus Man is back. I hope you enjoyed Octopus Man by Jordan Group, as performed by yours truly. If you enjoyed that tale and would love to read more from tonight's very talented feature author, you can help support him by visiting simplyscarypodcast.com slash group. That's simplyscarypodcast.com slash G-R-U-P-E. Beyond numerous other tales available at Reddit, you might enjoy digging into the horrors that lie beneath the asylum, a novel about a security guard, a padlocked door, and a search for uncomfortable truths. Or if shorter haunts are up your alley, why not try his collection of short tales, No Sleep Tonight? Both books currently available on Amazon. If you do decide to stop by his profile, please leave Jordan a kind word and let him know you heard about him on this show and that Otis Jiry sent you. It would mean a lot to me and to him. Thanks again for your support of this program and of tonight's featured author. Hmm. A killer that can hide almost anywhere with near-perfect camouflage. You'd think that would keep me out of my basement anytime soon. But then again, the less anyone knows what I keep in my basement, well, the better. Although I'm not the only person who has secrets best kept hidden, let's turn to our second tale of the evening from Jordan Group, one of a fellow whose attempts to clean out his father's old house leads to the discovery of something a bit more unpleasant than mildew. Without further ado, I present to you The Monster in My Dead Father's Basement is Getting Bigger. The sponsor of today's podcast is Surfshark. We spoke earlier about how a good VPN can protect you from sinister trackers. However, Surfshark's protection doesn't end there. You know those frustrating pop-ups that say, unavailable in your location? Well, you can forget about those if you have a VPN. Switch your virtual location and access any content, website, or app that's blocked in your country, because being left out of things is no fun for anyone. Now, let's say you're the type of person who likes to have a safety net for your safety net. Why have one net when you can have two, right? Well, Surfshark has your back. You can have even more protection if you add Surfshark Alert to protect your identity and Surfshark Search to get accurate private search results. Anyway, back to those pop-ups. Does being blocked from the hippest access to videos bother you as much as it does me? If it does, let me tell you why a VPN is the solution to your problems. A VPN doesn't only increase online privacy, which you need, trust me, and helps you avoid hackers. It also helps you access entertainment, because the content you see is limited by your geographic location. But if you use a VPN, you can change your virtual location and forget about restrictions and censorship. Can't find what to watch on Netflix, Hulu, Disney Plus or other streaming platforms? Unlock new libraries with a VPN. 
can't watch a YouTube video, connect to a different location with a VPN, can't access certain websites or apps through school or office networks, try a VPN. So try Surfshark risk-free with a 30-day money-back guarantee. Get Surfshark VPN at surfshark.deals slash scary stories. Enter promo code scary stories for 83% off and three extra months free. You heard me right. Three extra months for free. That's surfshark.deals slash scary stories. The couch reeked of cigarette smoke, ashes, and body odor. It was faded yellow like the wallpaper, its strings creaking loudly as I sat down. It smells like him, I thought to myself, surveying my late father's living room and its precarious stacks of old books and magazines. I couldn't help but sigh. It was going to take forever to clean this place up. A fat cockroach ventured out of the couch cushions and began to scuttle across my bare arm. I stood up feeling sick and saw several more of varying sizes abandoning the couch like a sinking ship. It's a good thing I brought rubber gloves, I thought to myself, flinging the large bug off my arm and an N95. I was about to put those things on when the lights in the house went out all at once. It was suddenly pitch black inside the living room and silent. The humming background noise of electronics and home appliances conspicuously absent. I could only hear the thud of my heart in my ears, accompanied by a nocturnal orchestra of crickets outside the window. Why had I chosen to come here at night to clean up? It was spooky enough as it was just being inside the house especially after he had died last month, sitting right there in his favorite recliner. Ghost felt so much more real in the night, with nobody else around. As I thought about that, a chill ran down my spine, and the room seemed to grow colder. In the darkness, I pulled up my phone and turned on the flashlight function. The harsh white light cast the room in a bright glow, and I surveyed the crowded, messy space around me. A narrow path through the piles of junk led toward the kitchen, and from there I could go downstairs to reset the breakers. The old house did this from time to time, its original wiring and circuits not designed for the strains of modern electricity. Starting to make my way through the piles of faded magazines and newspapers, I edged sideways and sucked in my gut at one narrow section to get through to the kitchen. Once there, I tried to ignore the rotten smell which greeted me, sweet and sour aromas of spoiled food, and something else much worse beneath that. It occurred to me there might be something dead inside of one of the cupboards. It could have been a mouse or a rat for all I knew. Neither one would surprise me. Opening the door at the top of the stairs, I began to make my way down the steps. They creaked and groaned beneath my weight, and I made sure to cast the light toward my feet to avoid falling. The stairs were lined with stacks of old journals and magazines, printed news articles and folders bulging with papers. Dad's research, as he'd called it. I felt a pang of regret, wishing I'd tried to understand them better. He'd grown emotionless and reclusive over the years, paranoid that others were mocking him for his theories. He truly believed there were things from another world living among us, invisible and in the shadows. We'd never been able to convince him to seek help as much as we tried, and my mother had eventually left him after years of emotional neglect. I was careful to avoid the wobbly stacks, as I made my way down the stairs to the lower level, as I imagined they would collapse like dominoes if I knocked something over. The precarious towers swayed and bent with my weight, 
pressing down on each step. I cringed, picturing one tipping over, causing a cascading effect that would somehow turn the whole house to rubble, like a massive Rube Goldberg machine. My breathing stopped as I heard something moving down in the shadows of the basement, further within the blackened space. It sounded like it was coming from the direction of my dad's old office. Probably just mice, I told myself, stepping from the bottom stair onto the linoleum towels in the basement. They crinkled and crunched beneath my feet, yellowed and brittled with ancient water damage. The sound in the distance stopped immediately, and my skin broke out in goose flesh as I began to tread hesitantly forward toward the source of it. The breaker box was in the furnace room. I'd go to it and flip the switches, then go back upstairs to clean. There was no way I was going to investigate that sound, coming from ahead and to the left, deeper in the basement. That was the kind of stupid thing they did in horror movies, right before getting killed. Creeping forward, being careful not to touch any of the precarious stacks, I finally arrived at the furnace room door on the right. As I pushed it open, that sound again came from the office through the den, which was just to the left of me. A noise like papers rustling and things being shuffled around. It immediately made me feel uneasy, my throat tightening with fear as I thought about my theory that the noises were being made by a mouse. That no longer seemed possible. Whatever was making that sound, it was larger. A raccoon, maybe? Or a possum? No, definitely bigger than that. Rushing faster, I nearly ran into a stack of boxes that was just around the corner, inside the furnace room. The idea of knocking something over and becoming pinned beneath a pile of magazines while that rustling sound grew ever closer was too much for me to handle. Nearly in a panic, I ran across the small cement floor room to the breaker box. I reached up for the lever and gripped it firmly, pulling it down, then jammed it back up into the arm position again. Nothing happened. The room was still drenched in darkness, aside from the beam of my cell phone's flashlight. That rustling sound continued in the distance, undeterred by my presence. My heart thudding in my chest, I reached out and pulled the lever down again and back up, resetting it once more. The lights remained stubbornly dim. And then I realized, of course, I hadn't flipped a light switch at the door of the furnace room. None of the basement lights were turned on, so I couldn't even tell if resetting the breakers had worked. So I walked away from the breaker box and flipped a switch in the wall near the door, expecting the lights to turn on. But they didn't. It was still pitch black in the basement of my dead father's house. And the longer I spent down there, the less comfortable I felt. My skin was tingling with a sensation telling me something else was down there with me, my primal lizard brain instincts urging me to run. I quickly realized why that was. That sound of rustling papers from my father's office was gone, replaced by a swishing sound indicating movement. Whatever that thing was, it was larger than a raccoon or a possum, and it was headed straight for me. More afraid than I've ever felt in my life, I stepped out of the room and began to move through the stacks of papers that lined the basement floor to ceiling, wall to wall. I tried to walk at first, pretending that the sound, like a large lizard moving in the night, wasn't real. But then, as it got closer, and I heard its bulk scrape against the doorframe of the den just behind me, I started to run. Too terrified to look back, I began to push over the stacks of magazines and papers, knocking them over with my hands as I ran past. The stacks toppled over, sending a collapsing chain reaction of junk towers in the thing's direction. Whatever it was, it made a pained sound, unlike anything I've ever heard before. It was a dark, alien sound, a high-pitched shriek mixed with an undulating drone like a swarm of bees beneath. Unable to stop myself from looking, I pointed the light from the phone in the thing's direction. 
All I could see was the boxes and papers being knocked aside by some large invisible force in the darkness. Whatever it was, I couldn't see it for some reason, but it could see me, and it was headed for me again, as indicated by the papers being knocked aside in its wake. Running as fast as I could up the stairs, I got to the top just as the thing began to bound up the steps from the bottom. I pushed over the stacks of boxes near me, sending another domino wave of junk toppling over, crashing into the bulk of the thing chasing after me. It was already so close. In the short moment of time it had taken me to push the piles of junk over, it had nearly reached the top of the stairs. Still, my plan worked and I heard the sound of it tumbling loudly down the steps. Panting and out of breath, I went through the door to the main level and slammed it shut behind me, just as the thing caught up again, scraping and scratching against the wood. I pulled a dead bolt closed as it pounded with its weight against the threshold. The door rattled and shook in its frame as I held it shut with all my body weight, feeling it pound against my back and hoping that whatever this thing was, it didn't have claws that could pierce through the flimsy barrier that I'd made between us. After a while, the pounding stopped. The dark house was silent once again, and I thought I heard the sound of it retreating down the stairs into the basement. But as I listened closely, I realized I could still hear the sound of its breathing, raspy and quick. What are you? I asked through the door, and the sound abruptly ceased. For a long time I just listened, waiting for it to go back into the basement again or just breathe again, so I knew where it was. I couldn't tell if it was behind the door or not, and after a while I began to almost wonder if I had imagined it all. Was there really an invisible creature living in the basement beneath my dad's house? The whole thing seemed impossible. Whatever had happened to the power, my attempts to reset the breakers had done nothing. It was still pitch black throughout the house. My phone had plenty of battery, so I cast its light around the room from where I sat with my back against the door. The stacks of books and magazines were still standing upright, unlike down in the basement where it was now in shambles. That was when I heard the sound of the thing descending the stairs, its footfalls noisy amidst the mess. I could tell exactly where it was based on those sounds. A very unusual thought occurred to me, hearing the creature heading back to the basement. I stood up and picked up a folder from one of the wobbly stacks in the kitchen. It was stuffed with pages of text, the margins thin in the print packed tightly together in a tiny font. I began squinting my way through the text and was amazed to see it was written by my father, and it was all about the thing in the basement. It appeared to be a continuation of a previous document which I could find no trace of. The pages were all scrambled and out of order, disjointed fragments of memories and recollections. Creatures clever. First the light, then the heat. Makes me go down there every time. It knows I have to go down there. Fix the furnace, reset the breakers, repeat. It's gotten so big. I remember when it was so small, so easy to ignore. I could almost pretend it was just a cold breeze moving things around and causing the hairs to stand up on the back of my neck. It feeds on memories, it feeds on thoughts and feelings. Do I feel anything anymore? Do I feel even fear? The answer is yes. Every time I go down there, the answer is yes. I'll kill it somehow. Kill it. It kill. Kill it. Uh, it will until it kills it or it kills me. How do you f defend yourself from something you cannot see? That last bit of garbled text made me feel sick to my stomach as I thought about my dad's final days and his confused and paranoid state in the hospital. Looking up from the pages, I surveyed the crowded room and realized he'd managed to defend himself from the creature in a way. He'd made a fortress out of his research just to keep the thing away and to warn him if it was coming. And then I realized the worst part. I had just unwittingly destroyed that barrier of protection. 
temperature began to plummet in the room, and I realized I'd have to go back down there again. Not that minute, but sooner or later, I'd have to face the creature again. Otherwise, the house would remain cold, dark, and unlivable. I picked up another stack of papers and began to look through them in the glow of my cell phone light. There were more rambling pages, many of which made no sense whatsoever. The text written sideways or spiraling in crude print. But then I would find one where my father had written coherently about the monster, describing exactly what he had learned. Another section caught my eye, and I read it carefully, growing more and more terrified with each sentence. It's gotten through the locks again. I'll have to lure it downstairs with another bribe. Uh, I hate doing it, but it's the only way. The poor creatures, they don't deserve this, but they're pests. Still, I, I don't like it. But it's better than having that thing up here with me on the main level creeping around and doing God knows what in the shadows. I don't trust it. The thing, I've begun to call it Samuel, although I don't know why, it's started to learn how to mimic sounds. It's like a ventriloquist casting its voice across the room and making you think it's leaving when really it's still sitting just next to you. What am I going to do? How am I going to get rid of this thing before it takes everything from me? I've already lost my family. What will I lose next? I looked up from this page written by my father to see the basement door was now hanging wide open, revealing the darkness leading downwards. The sound of footsteps could be heard coming towards me again as the towers of papers began to topple, this time towards me. A stack of books, magazines, papers, and folders stuffed with documents. They all began to tip over, landing on me and pinning me to the floor. A moment later, I could smell the creature's rank odor as its invisible face floated above me, examining me. I shook with fear, feeling its gaze on me, feeling it taking something indefinable from me, like I was losing a part of myself. The very thing which made me, me. It's in the room with me now, sniffing through the cupboards and the pantry for more dead rat carcasses while I remain pinned to the floor beneath a thousand pounds of junk mail and rambling missives. I'm reading through the pages around me frantically, trying to find something, anything that will help. I'm clueless as to what I should do right now. It feels like I should know, but I've somehow forgotten some critical things, memories that were very important which the monster has deemed to feast upon. Who do I call if I need help? Why can't I remember anymore? The creature is coming back to feed again, sniffing at my face in the darkness, pondering what it will take next. It feeds on all sorts of things, and it's always hungry. I hope you enjoyed The Monster in My Dead Father's Basement is Getting Bigger by Jordan Group as performed by yours truly. If you've enjoyed what you've heard tonight, I'd like to remind you one last time that tonight's featured authors can be found by visiting our website. Just visit simplyscarypodcast.com slash group. That's simplyscarypodcast.com slash G-R-U-P-E. Whether you are beneath the asylum or expecting no sleep tonight, look for his work on Amazon and support his latest creations on Reddit. As a reminder, if you decide to give any of this talented author's stories a read, Please consider leaving them a quality review and a kind word or a thoughtful public comment and an upvote. And be sure to let them know you heard about them here on this program and that Otis Gyrie sent you. It means more to me than you can imagine, and I'm pretty sure they would very much appreciate it as well. Thanks again for your support of this show and of tonight's featured author. 
Now, before we go, I'd also like to take a moment to thank you personally for joining me for this episode of Scary Stories Told in the Dark. If you enjoyed what you've heard on today's program, please take a moment to stop by our iTunes page or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts and leave us a five-star review and a kind word. It makes a huge difference and would mean a lot to us. If you'd like to hear a premium extended edition of tonight's and all of our other episodes featuring twice the terror, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the patrons link in the menu at the top of the screen. You'll find yourself at chillingtalesfordarknights.com where you can purchase season passes for this podcast and our other quality storytelling programs or become a patron for as little as $5 per month and get access to our entire audio archive dating back to 2012, all of it ad-free. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all of our latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. You can subscribe to me on YouTube as well at the Otis Cherry channel where you'll find releases of my series, Horror Storytime, dating back to 2014. And you can find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, too. Just search for Otis Gyre. Until next week, stay spooky and get some sleep, if you can. <laughs>
chilling tales for dark nights.